Good evening, and welcome to Flashpoint. I'm Michael Kotman, political reporter for New York Newsday. The Civilian Complaint Review Board has seen a dramatic increase in the number of charges of police abru abuse and brutality. This week, Mayor Giuliani appointed a new panel to monitor police corruption. Tonight's Flashpoint, who should be policing the police? With us are Norman Siegel, Executive Director of the New York Civil, Civil Liberties Union, and Bruce Smurdy, an attorney who has defended many officers against charges of police brutality and abuse. And opposing me, as always, is my colleague Eric Brindell, editorial page editor of the New York Post. Eric? Michael, thank you. Uh, good to be with you. Welcome, guests. Uh, Michael, the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, is a damned if you do, damned if you don't proposition. You say complaints are up. If complaints weren't up, we'd be saying people were scared to go to the CCRB. Complaints are up in part because cops are making a lot more arrests than they used to. Arrests mean police action. Arrests mean contact with uh, the population of people who are being arrested. Inevitably, that gives rise to complaints. There's yet another factor here. Some people are using this process, drug dealers in particular, to lodge complaints against police officers in order to drive them out of their areas of commerce. Crying police brutality is a neat trick. It works. And I think we have to realize that in contemporary New York, cop bashing has become a very popular sport. So I have a lot of trouble with the notion that it means something significant to say complaints are up at the CCRB. Eric, last week at hearings before the very CCRB that you're referring to, we heard graphic testimony from residents, some African Americans, some Latinos, who talked about in very graphic terms being beaten and being victims of police abuse. Many of these people, Eric, were not drug dealers, but these were people, these were voices that have been ignored in New York City for far too long. And it's time we listen to some of these people and go against and talk about some of the corruption in the New York City Police Department. These, in fact, are some not all, but some corrupt cops, who are preying on the very communities that they are sworn to protect. An independent board to investigate and monitor police corruption is long overdue, as I said before. Police are now uh, being accused of abuse, not only um, in their power, but also physically abusing citizens. And I think it's time that we address the issue and listen to some of these citizens, who, again, are not all drug dealers. Uh, Mr. Smurdy, you've had a lot of experience in this realm. Uh, how, how do you think uh, the CCRB issue is playing. What do you think of the rise in complaints and Michael's comments on it? I think the rise in complaints are due to the fact that the police have been aggressive in enforcing the so-called quality of life uh, matters, uh, squeegee individuals, prostitution. What's happening is when police are told to go out and take care of a particular situation, uh, there are inevitably going to be a rise in complaints. With, those, with that rise in, in complaints, there's going to be a public perception that somehow or other the police are becoming more brutal or more totalitarian. Now, that is an improper uh, uh, step to make just because there happens to be a rise in complaints. The rise in complaints basically means that the police are more active, the police are doing their job. They're doing the job that the mayor wants them to do, and they're, do, they're doing the job that the public uh, wants them to do. Thanks, Mr. Smurdy. We're going to get Norman Siegel in here. And is it a perception that police are more brutal in New York City, or is it in part reality? Uh, it's in part reality, but let me deal with some of the misstatements so far. I think that we have to fight crime, but we also have to respect people's civil liberties. They're not mutually exclusive. We must have both. We do not have both at this point. First, with regard to uh, complaints as a result of arrests, historically about 25 percent of the complaints are out of an arrest uh, in 90. Uh, three, I think it was 26.7 percent of the complaints came out of an arrest. In the last six months of 94, only 12.1 percent of the complaints came out of arrest. The overwhelming percentage of the complaints, almost 70 percent, come not in the arrest situation. They come with a patrol situation where the officer is walking around or in the car and is abusing, especially attitudinal problems, with uh, citizens on the streets using the N-word, uh, using the F-word. That's where the complaints come. Second, with regard to the drug dealers. I would agree with Eric, I think probably in part, that although there's been no real study anecdotally in street justice, there are some people who are making those complaints. But the overwhelming percentage in 94 of the complaints at the CCRB when analyzed come from people who made a complaint for the first time. They have no history with the previous CCRB. So it undercuts that argument to some extent. I think there is an element of that, but I don't think you can dismiss uh, a large percentage of the 5,000 complaints filed in 1994 based on people who are bad guys trying to 
either get back of the cops or try to create some situation where they can plea bargain later on. Misconduct is a serious and substantial problem. We must have an effective mechanism in order to have fairness both to the citizen and the police officer. We've made some incremental progress in the city, but we've got a long, long way to go. Let's, get to, let's start the debate, and I just want to um, have Mr. Smurdy respond to the, uh, the Mullen Commission, which uh, under the Dinkins uh, administration had hearings and uh, brought to the forefront some very uh, extraordinary testimony from a number of police officers like Michael Dowd, who was dubbed the, the Coke Cop. Um, if you, you talk about the perception of brutality and the perception of abuse, but you have your own officers who are at some of these hearings who uh, admit and testify that they were on the streets selling drugs or shaking down drug dealers and such. That's not perception. It, it's, it's reality, is it not? No, there is a certain reality uh, where police officers are in, engaging in, pa in corruption or patterns of corruption. But I submit to you that if you take a look at the 26,000 New York City police officers and it's the now 30 actually, it's 30, 37. Right? Okay, so we're going to be time after the merger. After the merger, it's going to be 37. Right, right, but you watch the CCRB won't get an increase in its funding in order to monitor this. But go ahead. Well, you keep well, fight, let, you fight that let, battle. Norman. Let Mr. Smurdy oh. finish the. What, I, what I'm saying to you is there are patterns of corruption. There are pockets of corruption. I don't think it's systemic corruption. I think that it has, has to do with the individual. I don't think it has anything to do with the way New York City police officers are policed by internal affairs. I think there are certain people who come on the job who, uh, who have larceny in their heart. But take a look at the statistics. Uh, if you have that number, 26,000, 38,000, whatever number you want to use, the number of individuals who are corrupt is so small that compared with other activities, uh, lawyer, doctor, etc. Uh, I, th I think that the police department has, one, done a good job as far as policing their own, and two, the patterns of corruption are so small and infinitesimal uh, uh, in percentage that I, th I think as a whole the New York City Police Department is I can't is, agree is, with you that excellent. they've done a good job on their own. You can't have police investigating police. Why? You don't have, why? Because why there's an inherent conflict of interest. You don't have to even be a lawyer to understand that if the police are investigating the police, you're going to have people who are going to, not only a perception, in reality, not be as vigorous and aggressive in going after their own kind. How when can we look at the CC, Norman, well, when I, we looked I'm at the CCRB, and I'll get back to you, but I want to do a little clarification for the listening audience. When you say police investigating police, you're talking actually about the corruption level, because on this, it, on the question of brutality, of course, the reason there's an independent civilian complaint review board is precisely because the position you espouse was adopted. Except it wasn't. And in fact, that is a, an independent board that isn't controlled by the police department. You it's, fought for it. You won that battle. I didn't win it totally. What happened in the you implementation with Dinkins and Giuliani is that they kept 50% of the people from the old CCRB. You don't like They're, the CCRB as it's now formed? I think it's better than the old system, but it's still got enormous problems and the implementation has not created the confidence and trust that we wanted. When they kept 50% of the people who used to be employees of the police department and kept them and didn't clean house, what they did is they set up a structure that was not as vigorous and not as independent as we needed. But the Manhattan Why DA's we... office is certainly not part of the police department. They the, investigate the, police corruption. The dist well, when you talk about and all corruption the four and other brutality, DA's office investigate when, corruption and brutality. I don't think the district attorneys on brutality as well as corruption ha are independent and have not been as vigorous as they should have been in the past. A young assistant district attorney once said to me, "I got a caseload of 35 cases. I can't go after the cops. If I go after the cops on my other 33 of my 35 cases, they won't cooperate with me." When Elizabeth Holtzman set up a unit to go after police brutality. The PBA brought 10,000 people out to picket her, which they have a First Amendment right and I defend them. But it sent a very chilling message with regard to the vigor and the independence. That's why you need independent review boards. And when we studied the CCRB, we came to the conclusion that there was a conflict of interest when the police employees were investigating the police. Norman, you just mentioned the, uh, the PBA, and I wanted to throw this out to, uh, to Mr. Smurdy. The PBA, uh, recently, there were reports that it tried to, in fact, thwart in investigations and, and warn police officers of impending investigations, and they went so far, it was reported, to, to plant newspaper stories or attempting to plant newspaper stories to warn all police officers of investigations that are coming. Um, this uh, says to me that, that there's a very deep-rooted 
uh, kind of corruption in the department. And as you mentioned earlier, you're, you're probably right that perhaps the overwhelming number of police officers are, are honest and, uh, and, and law abiding. However, you can't dismiss the role of the PBA in, 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 in the corruption. How, how do you deal with that? And how are police going to police the PBA? Well, I'm, I'm not a spokesman for the PBA. However, I do have experience in dealing with members of the PBA, and I can tell you they're upstanding individuals. Uh, there have been police officers who have sought the help of the PBA, but that's what they're there for. They're union representative. They're, they're line organization. Do you and think if they see uh, an Ill illegality taking place, they have an ethical obligation to go forward? I would think so, and yes. Do you think that that has happened? Not that, not that I've seen, no. Plus Mike's uh, reference to the BBA when the Mullen Commission uh, pointed this out, they seem to be defending their position with regard to that was part of their union obligation and you seem to buy into that analysis here. No, I don't buy into the analysis. I buy into this. I know that when there's a problem and a police officer goes to his uh, line representative, the representative will then speak to the PBA and say, Somehow or other, there's an allegation against this guy. We don't know what it is. And I'll tell you why the police officer is told not to tell the PBA individual why, because there's no privilege. So what happens is the PBA individual will say to an attorney, look, sit down and speak with this guy, because if there is some sort of problem, then his conversation with the lawyer is privileged. Norman, if is I this process abused in a minor way? You were very candid before, and you said, Yes, that I had a point. There were some people who were sometimes using... Sometimes you do, Eric. Sometimes I do, and I, I, I was glad to see you acknowledge that in this particular me. case I did. No, he's not, Norm's in no danger of encouraging me. That's just safe that We've known each other a long time. He doesn't encourage me a bit. But in this particular instance, uh, we know, and we know in Washington Heights, for example, that there were people who came forward and lodged brutality complaints, and it turned out that their goal was to get the cops out of that neighborhood. And in fact, residents of the neighborhood were pretty unhappy with that result because they felt they had been abandoned or were in danger of being abandoned to the drug dealers. Right, but the Is this a phenomenon that concerns you as we treat with this CCRB issue? Sure. How do we protect against that taking over? Sure, we had no, uh, that phenomenon uh, does bother us, but I think that sometimes, including you, uh, you make it larger than it really is. The reality is is that's a small percentage of the complaints and you focus on that, you don't focus in on the larger part where real citizens are abused by officers. Uh, I told Commissioner Bratton when I first met him a year ago that if he did one thing in the city, if he could get cops from using the F word, it would change a lot of the dynamic in the city of New York. I think that there's real serious problems, it's an attitudinal thing, it doesn't deal adequate training, and too often police commissioners, the mayors, they rationalize or deny some of these problems. And second, what they do, although corruption and brutality are linked, the Mullen Commission studied it and concluded that, what happens, we want a corruption unit and we want a brutality unit. They should be together. Do, because these, sensi the do these sensitivity training seminars work? Uh, they're not adequate at this point. Uh, you have to continue to try to build the bridges between my clients who stereotype cops and the cops who stereotype my clients. Forty two percent of the police don't even live in this town. I've heard stories about how cops say, I'm going into the zoo. I gotta deal with the animals. Yeah, we hear that we hear that all the time. Well, that's, you not, that's, think that's that some of it is not something to dismiss. It's not something to dismiss, but it's quite anecdotal. And maybe and maybe Norman, right, well, and Norman says Norman says that I'm saying things that are a small part of the problem. Well, I'd like to suggest that well, well that gets repeated a lot, that's a small part of the problem too. You made a larger point. You said you, we ought to fuse. Right. The corruption I think agency and, brutality. and the civilian complaint review board. Right. We've advocated uh, what that. What would you suggest? I a would huge suggest outside monitoring It doesn't board? have to be huge. What you have to have is quality. What you have to have is a unit of lawyers, former law enforcement people, 